I'm Taz James. We're once again back at uh, Compassion City Church for Upper Room. Tonight we're going to hear Hunter Hall speak. So I hope you guys enjoy. I'll see you guys in a second. Steph, will you pop up that first scripture for me? We're going to read out of Matthew 18 through 20 NLT, New Living Translation. Amen. So it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, let me use some context, Jesus has already died and rose from the grave. So he is back, King of Kings, Amen. Lord of Lords. And he is the man. He's about to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God where he is right now. Amen. And it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What I want to talk about tonight is this. That verse, we've all heard it a million bajillion times. And if you take that verse back into the original context which the language was written, it says, go unto all the nations. And tonight, we're really not preaching anybody new. This is going to be kind of a message for family. So I pretend you and me are sitting at Jamoka's and we're one-on-one. -on -one, and that's what I want to give you tonight. It says this. It says, go unto all the nations preaching the gospel. We've all heard that. The first thing you think of is go unto Africa. Go to Nigeria. Go to a mud hut in the middle of Asia and preach the gospel. And that's the Great Commission. And a lot of times we disassociate ourselves with it because we say, oh, well, go unto all the nations. Well, I'm not going to all the nations, so apparently I'm not living up to it. The original language in this, and forgive me, it was so much that it literally would have taken 20 minutes for me to break it down for you exactly. What it was saying in the context when Matthew, when that was written, was along your journey, make disciples. I want to talk about your journey today. And I think the problem is, is that a lot of times when we think of along the journey of a disciple, along the journey of a believer, we think, yeah, it's no problem to make disciples. It's no problem to grow churches. It's no problem to preach the gospel. But along my journey, it's a problem because we disqualify ourselves so easily. And I got a few points. Number one, to make disciples of all nations, first thing is first, be a servant. You are more blessed to give than you are to receive. This is going to be simple and quick and fast. Be a servant. Dude, it does not matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter where you go. You can serve people. You can love people. The other night we went out to a restaurant, we ate, and we made friends with this waitress named Kimberly, dude, and we just loved on her. Basically, we just laughed at her jokes. We were just having fun, and it was just, it was awesome. So we, um, everybody turn your attention. The most beautiful couple in the world walking in. Hey, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so we walk in, and basically we just love on her. We get to learn this lady's name. We get to talk to her, and we get to bless her with a tip because, you know, if you're just... Man, if you're talking about people, especially if you tell them about Jesus and then you don't tip them well or you're not generous, man, it kind of robs the, it kind of robs the sense considering God came and gave. For he so loved the world, he gave everything that ever mattered to him. We have to be a generous people. And so be a servant of people. Serve people around you. This is really simple because when we say things like go and make disciples of all nations, you're thinking, okay, i got to have a seminary degree. i got to know the Greek, the Hebrew. I basically got to be Tyler King or Cass, okay? That's basically what you're thinking. <laughs> but... What I'm saying is, is that you don't. Because if God can use a fool like me, and like Jacob Pullen, then dude, we can all do this. This is meant for us. And it says, along your journey was the original context. So, be a servant. You're never more like Christ than when you are laying down your life and serving others. You may think that laying down your life, it says, for there have no greater love than this, that he who get lay his life down for his brother. No, greater have no love than this, that when you stay over at work because you know the lady who doesn't know Christ or the guy who doesn't know Christ is struggling with getting their stuff done, and you lay your extra 30 minutes down at the end of work to help them. That's serving. That's laying your life down. And we don't think about it in that context. When we think about Jesus and making disciples, we think it's this big, huge, great thing, and which don't get me wrong, it is, absolutely. There's people that have lost their lives to that, and I'm not dishonoring that. But I'm saying, in our everyday going and coming, man, we can make a difference. You can show Christ, and it's not as hard as you think it is, dude. I'm telling you, God's changed my life lately with this. And it says, like, do you remember when Jesus was going with, I think it's Cleopas. Is that right, Jacob? Jesus had risen from the dead. He's walking with Cleopas and what I guess scholars believe to be his wife. And he goes, they're walking along this road, and it says that their hearts were burning within them. They're walking and talking with the Savior about Jesus who died, who they thought was the Messiah. They didn't recognize him. So, and I, I think it's funny because we know that God hid his image from him. We know that they didn't recognize him until Jesus wanted to recognize him. But I think it's funny that when they were sitting down at the dinner table, once they got to where they were going along the journey, they were sitting down and he recognized him when he broke the bread. 
And a lot of people say, like, I think Furtick just came out with a whole message about how they saw the hands, or they saw the holes in his hands, and they realized it was him. I think they realized Jesus, because anytime you saw Jesus in that day, he was serving somebody else. And when he took the bread, the very thing they were sitting at the meal at, and he broke it and gave it, that's when you recognize Jesus. I would say this tonight. You, people will recognize Jesus in your life when you give. Sacrificially give. I don't want to talk about it, but for real, if, man, listen, I'm the most tight, cheap, stingy, greedy person you've ever met in your life. I did not want to give. I never understood tithing. I never understood giving. Since God sent Stinson and God, because Stinson showed me, Stinson gave me a really bad one night. He gave me this series. I started listening to it. And God just really started speaking to my heart and talking about my finances. For a lot of us, you're moving on. You're, you're thinking about marriage. You're thinking about, you know, careers. Man, when you tithe and you give God your money, it's an offering. It's surrender to him. But above that, you become generous, dude. But beyond belief, like, it doesn't matter. You can be a generous people. And that's when God sees, and that's when people see God in you the most. Another thing, and this is something, of course, I'm not speaking from a position of I've been there, I've done it, I've accomplished this because I have not. This is for all of us. It says this, be a model. You can't take anywhere, you can't take anyone somewhere you've never been. So the first part that I would say to making disciples is one, you've got to serve them. Two, be who you preach to be. Be a model. I can't take you anywhere that I haven't already been myself. I can't give you something I don't already have. Guys, that comes through communion with the Father. That comes through worship. That comes through getting honest with God and seeking Him daily. Okay, next, you filled up to pour out. Your integrity matters, dude. Integrity matters. I know purity mattered a lot when we were 16 and, you know, we were getting into dating. And we were thinking about this and that. It still matters today. It still matters when you're married. It still matters every day, dude. Purity is key. I'm just bouncing through this. Personal revival always equals public revival. We pray for revival to happen in our college. We pray for revival to happen all along this mountain. But until it happens in you, man, like John says it best. And I know I just sound like a broken record repeating exactly what John says, but it's true. Man, what, you can't, what God can't do anything through you that he hasn't already done in you. You know what I mean? He's got to do it in you first before he can do it through you. And here's the beautiful part about it. Remember, remember though, before the creation of the world, we've all heard it. God chose you and created you before the creation of the world. He chose a purpose for you. The enemy will distract you. He will lie to you. He will say you're not good enough. He'll say the sexual sin that you still fight with behind closed doors disqualifies you from ever pouring into somebody else. I believe that lie for so long. I believe the lie that, you know what, you don't know enough. You're going to mess up scripture. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be scary if I, if I spend time. It's going to be scary if I do, you know, if I reach out to someone. If I just absolutely just ask the waitress, hey, can I pray for you? Is there anything that, that's going on right now? Because we're about to pray for this food. Can I bless you? Can I do anything for you? Dude, it's simple things. We all know this. But when the enemy reminds you of how disqualified you are and how unable you are to reach people, I lived under that life for so long, guys. And I'll tell you this. Dude, you've got to know scripture. You've got to quote it. You've got to remember, man. He created you. Before the creation of the world, he had a purpose for you here to serve him. You were created for one reason, a purpose. If you're single and you're looking for the person, if you're looking for the one, which you're really looking for the two because Jesus is the one. If, if you're single, let me ask you this. If you were created for a purpose, which every single one of us were, and if the person you're supposed to be with your spouse is to help you, is your helpmate, like Genesis gives us the definition of, if you're looking for the one that God has for you, but you're not pursuing the purpose that God has for you, he can't give you anything you've not, you're not ready for. He knows you couldn't steward it. So if you, and I'm not saying do to get because it's not even like that. Because when you start living in your purpose and you start walking in your calling and realizing you were created for this life, you were created for God's joy, nothing else will matter. I promise you. Nothing you thought mattered, it, it doesn't, it, it's not going to mean anything anymore. But I'll say this. How can God give you a person to help you with your purpose? When we haven't even taken those first steps into our purpose. And if you want to identify what your purpose is, think about the thing, think about the thing that gets to you. Think about the thing that can make you laugh, it can make you cry, it can drive you. Think about the thing that scares you the most. When you think, let me ask you this. If you knew that right now, tonight, if you could do anything in God's will, anything at all, and you knew he would not fail you, you can ask him for anything. Whatever it would be is probably your purpose. If you say, I would go home and I would share the gospel with my family and I would give it to them as, as clear as I could, I would serve my workplace until everybody knew the gospel, until everybody knew Jesus as their own. 
That's probably what you're created to do. The thing that scares you the most, the thing that intimidates you the most. And I'm being so simple, so fast. I'm not trying to be eloquent, sorry. Not a good personal speaker. This is my last one. This is good, it looks at my next you say, I swear it gets good. I'm just kidding, it's not good. Too. If there's anything good, it's because someone else supported into me, and Jesus is good. So, I think the third most important step, absolutely above all, if you don't get anything else, get this. The most important step for us along our journey to reach people is be a friend. Be a friend man. Sometimes it's not about having all the right answers. Sometimes when people talk to you about broken situations, about their family that you have no idea how to talk about, when, when someone pours something on you that you don't know all the answers, yeah, it's good to not know the answer, man. It's good. It's okay. 90% of the time, people are looking for someone to listen to, man. More times than not, the people that God's put in my life that I feel like, okay, I need to be a friend to them because this, you know, God wants to do something in their life and I think I can help them and da 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 Dude, when I started doing that, more times than not, I learned more from them than they ever learned from me. Because in your purpose, man, in you walking this thing out, you may think that it's all about you grabbing and pulling other people. It's not, man. God's the one that does it through you. God's the one that created us for this. And when we do this, we do more giving our lives than we ever do trying to save our lives. And we know that. Will you go with me to John 11, 33 through 35? So this is Jesus. Jesus is heard that Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, died. Lazarus meant a lot to Jesus, so he's traveled this long, long distance to go to the house where Lazarus is dead. Lazarus has been dead for three days, and we're jumping in right in the middle of the story. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Let me stop right there. You know, when you're being a true friend with, to somebody, when you really love and care about people, Jesus was the King of kings, the Lord of lords, on the most important mission on earth. The most important mission that has ever been. And he had people, two, two women, who if I could tell you their backstory, trust me, they didn't deserve it. Two women who he was deeply troubled and angered with. You know when someone hurts your best friend? Think about, listen, think about, think about someone you love the most. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister. If someone was to come at them and say something bad about them and begin to hurt them, would you not get angry? Would you not raise up a standard? You didn't care what happened. It doesn't matter. That's my family. You don't talk about them. The true sign, man, of someone who can make it. Look at our king, man. He's troubled with these people. He's the answer. He's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and he's the answer. And he walks in, and it says he was deeply troubled, and he was angered. Because that what hurts them hurted him. Hurt him. Hurt him. That what hurts them hurts him. So go to this next part. You can continue on the next part. It says, where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then... Jesus wept. He was going to the place that he knew where Lazarus was. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. And he wept. He wept with them. My final point is this. Be broken with the broken. All right, guys. That was Hunter Hall tonight speaking in Upper Room. I hope you enjoyed his message and, you know, learned a little something. Like, comment, subscribe if you like the video. And, uh, you know, follow me on Instagram if you want to at these cat, the Cass James. I put videos like a, like this up anyways every week. So uh, I think that's it, Victor. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace.